Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Sunday liquor sales and unionizing daycares. These issues surfaced again at the Capitol and we discuss in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. We'll have more on those issues in just a moment, but first. On Thursday, lawmakers received the financial picture of the budget they are now tasked to resolve. Today's new budget forecast for the next two years is very good news for Minnesota. The projected deficit has been lowered by $463 million. That's a 42% reduction from what was predicted just three months ago. By comparison, the $627 million deficit now projected for the next biennium is about one-tenth of the $6.1 billion deficit projected for the next biennium when I took office in January 2011. I'm planning to release my revised budget proposal during the week of March 11th. I expect to propose that most of the money be returned to Minnesota taxpayers in additional tax reductions. An upfront exemption from sales taxes on capital investments by businesses will encourage new construction projects and other business investments which will continue our job growth. I also want to increase the renter's tax credit to treat Minnesota's renters fairly with homeowners to whom I'm proposing to provide a $500 property tax rebate. Minnesota's economy hit bottom in GDP in June of 2009. So we are over three and a half years into this economic recovery and it's very incremental. So uh, it, it seems like uh, the governor's message of uh, continuing down the path, if we're gonna continue down the path and provide for the things that I think most Minnesotans think are important, the investments that are important, uh, we're gonna continue down the road of doing significant tax reform uh, to try and improve the stability of Minnesota's economy really an opportunity for us to look forward uh, for the first time uh, in a long time. Uh, there are investments we need to make. Not just, we don't need to just deal with the problem immediately in front of our noses right now. We can look five and ten years out and start making the kind of investments that we need to make in the state of Minnesota to position ourselves. Um, you know, we're obviously very happy with uh, the, the news today. Um, it shows that the policies that we put in place over the last couple of years have worked. Uh, that the economy in Minnesota is recovering, uh, and that Minnesota is headed in the right direction. What we have learned is that when we restrain government growth, when we keep taxes low, when we try to, to, to roll back regulations, allow people to keep more of what they earn, that as, as uh, Minority Leader Doubt said, the economy grows, and then we have plenty of revenue to take care of core functions of government, which is a goal that we all have for sure. allowing daycare providers to collectively bargain as a union. It was an issue that created considerable controversy two years ago, and this week it resurfaced. For many, many years, I used child care services, both um, family child care services and center services. And I can't tell you how important it is that we have high quality child care and how important it is for the future of our children in our state. This legislation would authorize family child care providers to collectively bargain with the state of Minnesota on issues of concern. This affects all licensed and unlicensed providers who receive state subsidies. You have to receive a state subsidy from the child care assistance program. The wages that most providers uh, first think of and that parents think of is the, uh, the agreement between a a parent and a child care provider. That's not what this union will have anything to do with. This is about lifting our profession and joining together so that we don't have to pass the high quality, the cost of high quality care onto families. And also it's about uh, joining together to um, make sure that the reimbursement rates are consistent with what the market rates. What we want to do is empower family child care providers to collectively bargain with the state on the rates and the regulations regarding how they do business. As a majority of providers in the state of Minnesota, we do not choose to be unionized. We do not choose to have the union represent us. 
we choose to remain independent small business women because the majority of us are women. We have chosen our occupations. We have extremely good training in the state of Minnesota. If you look at the state and how we represent against other states, our training is excellent. We already have a group who legislates for us, MLSCCA. A smart business owner is not going to absorb the cost of union dues. They will pass that on to the provider or to the consumer, which would be the parents. Already, some of them struggling to make those um, child care payments. The bill author, Senator Sandy Pappas, sat down with us to talk about her legislation. Senator, let's begin with your legislation. And I have a child in daycare, and she was just asking me the other day, what is this all about? So mm -hmm. that's a, probably a better question for you to answer. Why allow for daycares to unionize? Well, first of all, we're only talking about the family licensed and legal unlicensed homes, about 9,000 of them, that take uh, the state child care subsidy funds. And so if you are a private pay um, parent, it really has no impact on you, except your provider could voluntarily decide to join the union. And then 30% uh, of those have to ask for an election or more than a majority have to sign a union card before there's a union. And you would not be obligated to be in the union, but if you are part of that 9,000 and the majority vote to form a union, then you would be obligated to pay kind of the fair share amount toward the union because the union would be representing you even if you're not in a union. So then they'll be able to negotiate with the state on issues of mutual concern um, for to the families, to the daycare providers, and to the state. So what are some of the benefits? You were talking about allowing them to negotiate with the state, but what type of negotiations would you foresee happening? Well, certainly they can negotiate over reimbursement rates. I mean, their reimbursement rates were cut 11 percent over the last two years. And that makes it very difficult for these family homes to survive. 39% of them have closed. And that means a lack of stability then for families who are looking for child care. Their average wage, and they work 50 hours a week, you know, 11 hours a day, 50, 50 weeks a year, is just under $5 an hour in the metro area and under $3 an hour in rural Minnesota. And these are professionals. They consider themselves professionals. Over 50% have a curriculum. Um, a percentage of them have uh, college degrees in early childhood development, and they're not able to make a living wage. Let's talk about some of the concerns that have sprung up. One would be, you know, Minnesota currently is ranked fifth as far as expenses for daycare to, um, to the families. So in your opinion, is it a legitimate concern then that, the, that daycare expenses could increase even more? Are they going to pass these costs on to the parents? No, I don't think the parents will see an increase at all. I mean, obviously, we do need to put more state dollars into the child care um, subsidy fund for working parents who could not afford to work if they didn't have some help with their daycare costs. And we want those parents in the workforce. We need those parents in the workforce. Um, it's good for their children to be in a structured uh, daycare environment. Um, but we have been shorting the fund, and we do not put enough money in, we don't pay enough, uh, high enough rates, and we have too many parents on the waiting list. Some of the other concerns, critics contend that this is nothing more than a way for unions to up their memberships, which have been slipping. Is that legitimate in your opinion? Well, I think unions have been broadening out into different environments, but they wouldn't be uh, pursuing this if there wasn't an interest from the daycare home providers. And they've been working on it for seven years and they've been organizing and they've been going door to door and talking to people during nap time. And, uh, and there is a strong interest in doing this among the daycare homes. And another one of the concerns was there might be an adverse effect on the market and many daycares are gonna stop taking these children who, the providers who do receive the subsidies from the state, they'll just stop just so they don't have to be in a union if they don't want to be in a union, and that could cause a shortage as well. Is that a legitimate concern in your opinion? I think there's really just an upside to this because uh, the potential there is for reimbursement rates to go up, and that's an advantage to the daycare providers. And um, if they don't take state subsidy, they don't have to be in the union, and if they do take state subsidy, they don't have to be in the union, but they would have to pay their fair share. I remember this coming up a couple of years ago, and we did discuss this issue with um, Governor Dayton and with the union representative who was at the uh, news conference the other day. And the real concern at that time was more about the governor's executive order, but there was also concern among daycare providers that 
they were being misled as they were filling out these cards. So is that a concern this time around? Is this a fresh go around with the union going to educate different providers about what they could indeed do for them? I've talked to AFSCME and they've assured me that they're very clear and very upfront with daycare providers and they have to have signed the cards within a limited period of time. I'm not sure what that is, but it's a small period of time, it's six months or a year or something. So the cards have to be fresh and they have to be new. Okay, my last question for you then is, I think that it's a fair question. Parents and daycare providers are gonna wanna know, will children benefit from this legislation? Oh, I think absolutely. I think they'll be the biggest benefactors because the opportunities with, when people work together, they can share best practices, they can do training together. I think it will be a real advantage for children to up the level of quality that they'll receive in these daycare homes. I have one last question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, there Your will last be, one is one last question. I know, I do this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there is going to be some pushback. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna counter that? And do you have support for this legislation? Um, we do have support for the legislation. We do have family homes all over the state that support the legislation. It's some, it is somewhat controversial and we'll be having hearings on it next week and starting out in my committee and we'll see how it goes. Okay, Senator Sandy Pappas, thank you for coming in. Right. We appreciate your time. Thanks. This group is showing support for legislation that legalizes same-sex marriage in the state of Minnesota. Senate author Scott Dibble says the time is right for this proposal. This is a day to be very, very proud to be a Minnesotan because Minnesotans have rallied around this unifying, this clarifying discussion about the power of love in our lives. And many, many Minnesotans over these past many years have been extremely brave, living their lives with courage, with openness, with authenticity, asking that they be granted the same freedoms that are guaranteed to everyone in our state. It's just time. It's simply time. It seems to me around here that the laws that we pass fall into three major categories. Laws that require things, laws that forbid things, and then there's this law, which would just be allow a law that allows things. It's that sensible middle category. We aren't prohibiting anything. We aren't compelling or requiring anything. We're simply allowing people to do what will come naturally to them and what so many of their brothers and sisters have had the opportunity to do for so long. I stand here today with my beloved Michael and our daughters. We're a family in the eyes of God. We were legally married in Canada on Michael's parents' 50th anniversary last June. But right here, in my home state of Minnesota, the place where I was born, where we live, work, pay taxes and raise our children, we are legal strangers. We uh, commonly get into this all the time, uh, you know, justification is for a moment, and then when things do change in your favor, then there's a rush. The very rush of de redefining marriage in a radically new and different direction is, it was not considered by the public in November's election. Matter of fact, I know of personally uh, a concentration of senior voters who were convinced by telephone calls that if they voted no on the amendment, they were actually voting against gay marriage. So there's, there's lots of reasons to believe that Minnesota's public is not ready for same-sex marriage, and nor are they ready for the legislature to take it upon themselves to change it at this time. A no vote on the ballot did not equate to support for same-sex marriage. A yes vote absolutely was a vote in opposition. So there's a difference, there's a, there's a marked difference between districts where there was a large majority yes and maybe a smaller majority of no because not every no vote was in support of uh, same-sex marriage. They just simply said, current law is adequate for us. Senator Sean Nee now opposes the idea to unionize daycares. He sat down with us to give his perspective on the issue. It's fair to assume that you're opposing the legislation that would allow daycare providers to form a union. Why so? Well, I'm not opposed if any particular group wants to form a union, but this particular segment is completely different than what anybody else would think about. We're not talking about employees unionizing. We're talking about small, usually sole proprietorships, small businesses, typically run by women, in their home very often. 
and they're employed by themselves. And th the way the bill is written, at least as I understand it, uh, the same type of unionization rules would apply to these business owners collectively as typically would be for employees. In other words, if uh, a majority votes to form a union, everybody's in. Um, we are not a right to work state, so what that means, even if you choose not to join the union, and the, the proponents will say, well, no one's forced to join a union. Well, that's true, you're not forced to join, you're just forced to pay 80% of the union dues. And that is just simply wrong to do to a small business owner. Now, when this issue sprung up two years ago and the governor advocated for it, what he was stressing was really he wanted to allow them the ability to vote on the issue. Is that wrong? Should they be able to at least vote on whether or not to unionize? Well, there's kind of a, two sides to that coin. One, one piece of it is, how does this apply to them collectively? With whom are they going to bargain? The legislature? Uh, we're not their employer. Uh, we set these reimbursement rates for the daycare rates. Uh, they effectively would be hiring a lobbyist. Why, why do they unionize to, form a lo or to, to hire a lobbyist? Uh, they can do that now they can, through their associations. Um, it, individually, if they're large enough, they can hire lobbyists. So if they form a union so that they can collectively bargain, they can't. They, they can't th there's no one to collectively bargain with. Uh, they will have to come to the legislature and lobby. Now, I guess you could have the union lobbyists do that on their behalf, but uh, why pay 3 4 5% of, of your total income um, uh, to hire a union lobbyist? And uh, and I forgot the other side of the coin <laughs> while we were talking. And that's okay. I actually wanted to move on to the, the financial impacts. What do you think those are going to be to the, the parents, to the provider of the... Well, uh, nobody knows right now. We did have an informational hearing on this. I believe it was last year. It might have been uh, two years ago. And a lot of these questions were asked. How does this work? How does this apply? How does bargaining work? And, and there were no answers. Um, uh, quite frankly, I've not been contacted by one daycare owner that says, please let me unionize. There's some out there in the state. Um, some of the most vocal ones are actually getting paid by the union. But I've not had one daycare, quite the contrary, I've had a number, a lot of them email me and say, no, 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 I don't want to join a union, don't make me do this. Um, it, but this is very much uh, a, a push by the unions. I think probably because they've got significantly diminishing enrollment in the private market, or private sector, uh, and this is a way to kind of bring up that um, membership. And you actually just answered my next question, but do you also think this could have an adverse effect on the market? Maybe um, some people would choose not to take children so that they wouldn't have to worry about the subsidy and therefore not have to join the union. Do you think there might be a shortage of daycares because of that? You might see uh, some. I, I think the bill only applies to licensed daycares. You, you might some switch over from licensed to legal, No, it would apply to non-licensed. Oh, it would apply to non-licensed. Well, that makes it even worse. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think you might see a little more black market you know, un, uh, unofficial, under the table, uh, or people scaling back and saying, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna comply with the law and just do one family's kit, those kinds of things. So there's, is there anything about this legislation, if it were reworked, that you could support? Well, if you wanted to take uh, those members that want to join a union and let them join their own union and everyone else can do their own thing like they're doing now, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't see the point of it. Uh, again, you get back to the purpose of a union is to collectively bargain with an employer. These are all individual employers. They're not going to bargain with themselves uh, that, because they already tell themselves what to do. Um, and they can't bargain with the legislature, but they can lobby. Uh, but they can do that now. Well, and that is their argument, is that they could collectively bargain then for different reimbursement rates, which have been cut significantly over the past few years. So they could arguably collectively bargain with the legislature or with MMB to try to up those reimbursement rates. Is there some merit to that argument? MMB doesn't set the rates. Uh, the legislature sets the rates and you don't bargain with the legislature. You, you, you appeal, you lobby, uh, but when we make the law, we make the law and that is a unilateral decision. There is no bargaining involved. Now, it might be a good decision, it might be a bad decision, but it's a unilateral legislative and governor you know, uh, together. Now the governor and the legislature collectively bargain. Uh, we do that all the time. Um, but individuals coming before the legislature aren't bargaining with us. They're lobbying us saying, please make this decision. So you talked a little bit about what you're hearing from your constituents. What are you hearing from other lawmakers? Is there a support, in your opinion, for this to move forward? Um, the, it, it, it breaks down mostly on partisan lines. Um, so most of the Democrats that I talk to say, sure, this is fine, or are pr promoting it. Uh, most of the Republicans that I talk to give the same kinds of comments and arguments that I'm giving, that this doesn't make sense, and it's really not going to get them a whole lot uh, that they can't do today. 
Okay, Senator Sean Nienow, thanks for coming in and conveying your message, we appreciate it. Glad to be here, thank you. Selling liquor on Sundays, it's an issue that springs off the shelves almost every legislative session, but rarely gains momentum. The Senate Commerce Committee held a hearing on the proposal, which brought proponents and opponents to the table before the committee laid the bill on the table. Stores in Minnesota, uh, their dominant demographic is between the ages of 25 and 50. And what we know from consumer research is that those folks do almost all their shopping on the weekend. I think all of us understand that anecdotally. Jobs, kids, activities keep you busy during the week. On the weekend, those sales are almost two to one Sunday over Saturday. I have been in the business a very, very long time. And the reason we oppose Sunday sales is because we don't feel that it is financially feasible to do. We pay $48,000 a year for in property taxes and we would be happy to have additional revenue. But we see this as no additional revenue and just additional cost, employee cost. And our, our customers have never asked us for Sunday sales. Uh, we are in, um, I would say, a, a family neighborhood on 53rd and Lindale Avenue South in Southwest Minneapolis. We have the largest wine club in the state of Minnesota. We are the second largest distributor for Surly beer in the state of Minnesota. And we do a very big business and our customers have adjusted certainly to the fact that we are closed on Sunday. For the same reasons as always, we've opposed it because our members have made it very clear they do not want to work on Sundays. Secondly, it's going, it's going to uh, expand to a seventh day, which every thing that I've seen, every estimate that I've seen, does not expand any more uh, purchasing of the product. It will just spread it over a seven-day period. Senator Roger Reinhart sat down with us to talk a little bit about his bill and about its chances for passage. And let's talk about what your legislation would do, sure. um, the options of being open versus not having to be open. Right, it's actually probably the shortest bill that will be introduced this session. It's literally like five lines long and it just says that liquor stores in Minnesota have the option to be open on Sunday. You know, and I think it's almost as important to talk about what the bill doesn't do. It doesn't require anyone to be open, nor does it require anyone to make a, a purchase. It simply allows for the opportunity. So to many, or to some, it seems like a no-brainer, Yet, the, and it's been around for decades, sure. the issue has, and yet it doesn't really gain a whole lot of traction. Right. And there's a lot of pushback by people in the industry. Why is that, in your opinion? Well, and there's a couple uh, dynamics that make that so. You know, the first one is, uh, and most folks are really surprised at this, the number one source of opposition is the stores themselves. You know, and I can empathize. It really is about we want a day off when we know that no one else can be open. We're not going to have com uh, competition in the marketplace. You know, the flip side of that is that consumers want to make a purchase. You know, when we look at the demographics of consumers, you know, stores primarily are in the 25 to 50 year old demographic. Those say that same demographic does almost all of its shopping on the weekend which we know anecdotally is true. You have jobs and families and week commitments, that's when you have some free time. And of the weekend, Sundays over Saturdays, like two to one. So this is when your consumers are making a purchase. So, you know, if you don't want to be open on a Sunday, the best thing is to have the government force everyone else to be closed that day as well. You know, so there's some fundamental free market sort of issues at play there. Um, but and you can I interject too? Yes. Some of the criticism that came up, or some of the opposition, they contend that their expenses wouldn't, in or their sure. expenses would increase, but the sales would not. Right, but of course that's predicated on this idea that they would have to be open, which is not true. You can have a choice to be open. I I enjoyed in in committee that one of the testifiers said our customers aren't asking for this. Fabulous. You don't want to be open, and your customers aren't asking for it. Don't be open. But elsewhere, there are store owners that would like to be open. There are customers that would like to make a purchase. So why would you not let them have that market opportunity? Well, the answer is simple. You're afraid of the truth, which is customers want to make a purchase on a Sunday, and you just don't want to be open. So I mean, it, it amazes me that there's sort of this disconnect between a business that wants to sell a product and customers that want to make a purchase. And normally, businesses cater to their customers. But in this case, uh, that's not the reality. And what do you think of the idea that the legislature has allowed for wineries to sell on Sundays and brew pubs as well, as long as they make the product or some part of the manufacturing is done on site? Right. Does that kind of put liquor stores at a disadvantage, in your opinion? And well, do they see that? You know, they don't. 
Um, and you would think that you would, because increasingly there are other venues um, to do this. And increasingly these old blue laws are going away. You know, the most recent example is just this week at the Capitol, the ability to do a pawn in a, in a pawn shop uh, is now going to be available on Sunday. And of course that was a carryover of, of those same blue laws. So, you know, we're one of 12 states, and never would I have thought that Minnesota, progressive Minnesota, but would be one of the last 12 states uh, to ban this issue. And to make it even more difficult, every single state around us, including both provinces that border us to the north, allow for these sales. So if we don't even want to take a market approach to this, let's talk about lost sales and lost tax revenue. You know, we don't know exactly what that amount is, but it's there. Um, and every one of us who lives anywhere near a border knows that that's the truth. What kind of traction are you gaining so far this session? You did have a hearing. Less traction than, than in the previous legislature. And I'll be honest, you know, when we had a Republican majority, there was more interest in talking about this free market, you know, less regulation, less interference by the government in how you operate your business. And I've had much more opposition to that this year with my party <laughs> being in the majority. So in 2011, for the first time in history, we passed the Senate Commerce Committee. I chose to hold the bill because we weren't getting a hearing in the House. This year, my goal is we had a courtesy hearing in the Senate, get to get a chance to talk about the issue again in a public venue. I'm hoping to have the same thing in the House. Uh, I and my House author have asked uh, uh, Representative Atkins, just allow a courtesy hearing. You don't have to have a vote, but let's at least get the issue heard in both the House and the Senate, and that would be significant. That's never happened before. So. It's a big change. Change takes time, especially in this process. And, and really, until the general public says, we want to see this change, um, we're, we're going to maintain the status quo. And until then, do you see any kind of compromise on this particular issue? It seems like it's so black and white. You're either open or you're not. Well, but you know, there, it's I, gray. I absolutely think so. And I think one of the uh, best uh, avenues to approach is, let's just be permissive. A great example is when the state decided to extend closing time. It didn't say you shall, it said you can, and then left it up to local units to make that decision. So in some communities we have municipal stores, and the municipal stores don't want to be open. Well, the community could say we're not going to do that. Other communities, border communities, may say we want to have the option for our stores to be open on Sunday. I really think that might be the best approach for the state to take. We're not mandating, we're not changing, we're allowing the decision to be made at the local unit where the variances around the state and in geography and in population can influence that decision. I really think though, it struck me now in three years of working hard on this issue, most Minnesotans, any poll shows 60 to 80 percent want to see this change made, but not badly enough that they're willing to do anything about it. So until Minnesotans are willing to write an email, call their legislator, send in a letter, um, again, the, the status quo is going to be maintained because the stores have a lobbyist here every day telling legislators why this shouldn't change. Okay, with those words, Senator yeah. Reinhardt, thanks so much for joining for us. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.